All right, welcome back everyone. My name is Jenny Kwan and I will be the moderator for this session. We have three great startups who will pitch to a panel of investors. Uh, the startups are The Octopus, Fleur, and Phonic House. Um, we'll give each of these three companies 10 minutes and only 10 minutes to pitch to the investor panel. And then following their pitch, there will be five minutes where the investor panel can ask questions to the company. If we run out of time for all the questions, we'll share the questions from the investors with the companies. Uh, please note that due to the short time period, only the investors will be asking questions of the company. Um, there are a number of ways to participate in this session though. Um, encourage the company presenting through the emojis on the bottom of your screen or send a general comment that everyone can see about the presentation in the chat section. Hey Jenny, can I pop in here for a quick yeah. second? Uh, I know we have five minutes for Q&A and there's also a link with a Google Sheet. So I guess for detailed feedback, we can fill that. And if we save it, the company should have access to the questions we pose over there, correct? I, I think yes. correct. that would be correct. Yeah. Yeah, just want to clarify that. Yep. Great. Okay, and then there's a question in the chat about where that link is. So we can put that in the chat window. Um, Okay, so we have a great group of investors on this panel, um, and you see their photos here. Gary Schifrin is the founder and CEO at Gravi. Gwen Edwards, um, we're so pleased to have the managing director of Golden Seeds. Raghu Iyer of Nextcubed, um, and Tushar Kansal of Consultancy Ventures. So thank you all for being here. Um, you can find uh, more about the great work that each of them is doing on the website. And uh, we call these investors to the stage um, after each company pitches. All right, so um, now we are gonna call on our first company, the Octopus, to the stage to pitch. The Octopus handles everything e-commerce related for restaurants. Um, please share your screen with your opening slide. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes, that looks good. Um, awesome. All right, you ready to go? Yes, I you am have, ready. To then you have 10 minutes to pitch. Go ahead. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting us, inviting us, The Octopus. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. My name is Daniel. I'm the founder of The Octopus, an all-in-one online service management for restaurants. The Octopus helps restaurants build menus optimized for online ordering and delivery. We deployed and managed the menus on third-party applications like DoorDash, Uber, and Grubhub. Another thing that we do is manage and configure the restaurant's online profiles on Google My Business and Yelp. And we set up unique links so that we can eliminate commissions. And, you know, um, if the clients, the restaurant clients want to order directly from the restaurants and not through a third-party platform, they can do that as well. Um, another thing that we do is we also provide a communication channel for restaurants so that they can deal with real-time issues without having to go through complicated funnels that were set up by DoorDash or Uber and so that they can also communicate with their uh, customers. The Octopus currently works with 69 restaurants across 12 cities in California doing about 137,000 in annual recurring revenue and about 20,000 in transaction fees per month. In the US, there are currently over 196,000 quick service restaurants like taquerias, burger joints, and delis um, in 2021. And those restaurants can make about 10,000 in incremental revenue each month with an average ticket size of about $30 by working with the Octopus. Our ideal customer, mom and pop quick service restaurants that operate taquerias or burger joints in the suburbs, tend to struggle the most with online ordering services 
Uh, and we found that oftentimes the challenge starts simply by, you know, sending them a document through email. Uh, it can be very complicated for them to do something like that sometimes. Um, so let alone having them go through DoorDash and create a menu on DoorDash and try to figure out, you know, how to optimize the menu. That I mean, that's asking too much of them, right? Like they didn't get into the business of, of restaurants so that they have to deal with all these platforms. If you are a Latino or you grew up with Latino parents uh, or parents that are just not tech savvy, you probably know the struggles because you probably have to do a lot of the, uh, you know, online stuff for them. The yeah, Apple takes care of all the online stuff, so restaurants don't have to. Currently, we ma uh, manage most of the services below, uh, and only a, and this is only a small percentage. Uh, there's actually hundreds of services out there, uh, you know, by demographic, by region, by the services they provide, and we aim to integrate with all of them so that we can help restaurants manage them. Out of the 69 restaurants we currently work with, 80% have told us something very similar. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, they usually say we didn't get into the restaurant industry to deal with online services. We got into the restaurant industry because we wanted to make great food. Um, however, third party platforms like DoorDash and COVID-19 have changed the restaurant landscape and online ordering and delivery have gone from a luxury to a necessity for most of these mom and pop restaurants. One of the things that restaurants lack prior to joining the Optopus is automation. Imagine you operate a restaurant and that you have to write down every order on a piece of paper. Now add to that three tablets and each tablet you have to confirm the order, set a timer, write down the items and send it to the kitchen. With the Optopus, all you need is one tablet, one printer, and the kitchen will get the orders with little to no interaction from restaurant staff. I don't know if you know this, but currently restaurants are also facing a shortage of staff. So this tool is pretty helpful for them. Our process is quite simple. Our application will automatically confirm the order, set a timer based on order history, and the order will automatically print to the kitchen. Another benefit is how much the order volume increases when a restaurant has optimized menus. I've attached two images, the one on the left is of an item that was uploaded by DoorDash from a PDF that was sent by the restaurant. The one on the right is of an item that has been optimized and built by the octopus. As you can tell, the one on the left is much easier to navigate and order through. And this actually can turn a $10 item into a $16 item, which increases the restaurant's revenue altogether. Currently, the Octopus has direct partnerships with DoorDash, Uber, and Grubhub. And as we onboard more and more restaurants, we are able to request lower commissions as we are treated as an enterprise. And if you're wondering why DoorDash or Uber would agree to lower their commission fees, well, that's because they can see the value of the Octopus. All of these companies are spending millions of dollars getting uh, new clients, you know, cost of acquisition, buying tablets, buying printers, hiring staff to build menus, uh, offering client support, shipping all these things, and the Optibus actually handles all of that for them. So they're reducing a lot of their, their onboarding costs as well. Our go-to-market strategy consists of deploying a team of outside salesmen that can physically visit and meet the mom and pops that own the restaurants and guide them through the entire process. We found that we have great success when we can speak their language and provide a human connection. The goal is to target suburban areas like Santa Cruz, Watsonville, and Seaside to continue growing our business. The Optibus charges a 750 one-time setup fee plus a monthly subscription. And on top of that, we also take a 7.5% transaction from all the revenue processed through the Optibus. So you might be thinking, why are we the perfect team to take restaurants on this journey? Well, we know the competitive landscape. We know how to build scalable systems. Our CTO, Prem, was on the banking industry for many years, and he dealt with millions of transactions on a daily basis. We know how delivery works, as my previous startup was an on-demand delivery service. And Rob, one of our advisors, has scaled SaaS platforms 
And to top it off, I lived with my mom who is a restaurateur and she has struggled all her life with technology. So I know that, you know, mom and pop restaurants desperately need the octopus to help them out with online service. We are asking for 1 million for a post money safe to get us to the following milestones in the next 18 months, 500 restaurants, 4.5 million in total transaction revenue and 1.12 million in annual recurring revenue. So if you're interested, please reach out. In the last eight months, we built our admin dashboard, a merchant application for restaurants, and we've been accepted into the Founders Institute and tech future groups. We've been invited to the California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and we're currently attending Google for Startup Sales Academy. My name is Daniel. I'm the founder of The Octopus, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or if you want to learn more about The Octopus. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, that is the um, end of the presentation. And um, we'll now ask the investors to um, start the five minute Q&A session. And we may have a little bit extra time um, because you finished a little early. Um, so uh, investor panel, please uh, feel free to ask your questions. Uh, thanks, Jenny. I can go here. This is Raghu from Nextcube. Daniel, great presentation. A lot of energy, you know, you definitely, you know, bring a lot of, you know, high power charge here. So a couple of questions. Uh, it's a very crowded space. And while the opportunity exists, I am not clear, you know, about how you are you know, I didn't see a clear business model, you know, that is scalable. And there were multiple revenue streams you talked about. Maybe you can highlight that and also speak to your competition. And then how are you looking to scale? What's your growth strategy, exit strategy, et cetera? I didn't see that in your presentation. Great questions. Um, so to to go back to you know uh, the competitive landscape, there's currently a, a few companies out there that actually aggregate orders. Um, but you know instead of solving the problem that we're that we're trying to target, which is to help mom and pops manage all these platforms, they just add an additional platform in there. And and it's great, you know, for the restaurants that understand how to do platforms. But for the most part, you know. That's just another another platform that you have to manage as a restaurant tour. Uh, and on top of that, you know, you still have to go in there and build your menus, you know, make sure that your accounts are correct, that you're getting paid, you know, all the funds, which the Octopus actually does. Um, we actually have the partnerships with DoorDash, Uber and Grubhub. So all of the revenue that is generated comes is funneled through the Octopus. So that's how we make uh, part of our revenue is by taking a management commission of 7.5%. On top of that, we do have the um, three subscriptions that we have. We have a $99 subscription, a $199 subscription, and a $375 subscription. Um, and, and these subscriptions have been designed so that uh, it's targeted to each individual's restaurant's needs, right? Some restaurants need a lot more help. Other ones might not need as much help because they might already have somebody that's helping them out, but you know they can still benefit from, from what the Octopus has to offer. Uh, and uh, to mention um, about this, the, the strategy to grow, uh, we are actually planning on continuing to target suburban areas like Watsonville, like Seaside, like Monterey, because a lot of the competition is going after cities. I hear a lot of San Francisco. I hear a lot of New York. I hear a lot of, you know, San Jose. But all of those platforms, all of those restaurants are already used to dealing with all of these services. So they don't necessarily need the octopus. And we've actually, uh, we've tried targeting those those cities and we tried in the past and it didn't work um, because many of them, like I said, they, they're already working with all these services and uh, they're used to it. Uh, so we figure that our service is much more needed in suburban areas like uh, smaller towns where, where you know, uh, um, these uh, delivery services and these online services are still um, pretty fairly new to them. Um, and we deployed um, uh, we deployed in-person sales uh, salespeople to target a specific city, 
and then you know reach out to these uh, mom and pop restaurants who really really appreciate the fact that they can connect with somebody and see them face to face as opposed to getting a cold call and then just being sold over the phone great um we may have time for one more question um so if any of our investors have a, a, a good question, urgent question, please go ahead. I would, I'd just like to ask um, a little more about the revenue model and and also to comment that it does seem like there's an opportunity to have a much improved user interface, even for consumers, when you've got so many choices. But I wonder if you, you know, you're taking your 7.5%, does the restaurant end up paying less because you're able to lower the DoorDash price? Or is it break even? And then I really want to understand your customer acquisition costs. It sounds like they're going that's, to be a little high. That's correct. So actually the restaurant makes 100% of the money that they otherwise would make if you were to go and order directly at the restaurant. Uh, the 7.5% is paid by the, lo uh, by the lower commissions offered right. on DoorDash and also by the customers as opposed to charging it to the restaurant who you know, tend to struggle a lot more because they have lower margins. Uh, restaurants okay great um i'm afraid we are out of time um but thank you so much um we would like to thank daniel uh for his pitch and if you're interested in learning more about aptipus their contact information is on the website or you can visit their table in the lounge um great we will now thank you we'll now call our next company fuller to the stage to pitch Fuller is has created the first disruptive AI technology that optimizes the value chain in the meat industry. Um, Robert Ekren, um, please share your screen with your opening slide. Great, um, and yes, awesome, we can see that. Um, you now have 10 minutes to pitch, go ahead. Very good. Uh, let me see here. I just have to check. Yeah. It's, it's All right. Yeah. Um, th first of all, uh, thank you very much for, for having me uh, to come here and pitch. I truly appreciate it. My name is Robert Ekram. I'm the CEO of uh, Voleur. And um, uh, we are optimizing the meat industry with use of AI. So first of all, I'll go in. Um, uh, I'll touch on a little bit more on uh, the global meat production. Even though there's a lot of focus on alternative protein sources, meat production is increasing every single year. And it stands for a significant amount of all CO2 emissions that is that are created from humans, approximately 14.5%. So it's a reason why it has a lot of, lot of focus in terms of a sustainability point of view. At the same time as this is happening, optimal utilization of animals is a global challenge. The industry goes from times when they have large inventories of uh, meat that piles up to other times where uh, they are not able to meet the, the market demand. And further, while that is happening, uh, there's also an incredible value and sustainability effect from optimal utilization of animals, basically being able to utilize them in an optimal way. And with our pr preliminary results of 5% optimization in terms of value of uh, of only uh, amount of animals, uh, the value of that in a global sense would be about uh, 30 billion US dollars. And from sustainability point of view, it's 355 million tons of CO2 equivalent. So optimizing this industry with a few percentages has a huge impact. So, and the reason why this industry can be optimized, uh, I'll, I'll go into that now. What you guys see here is a very broad overview of the meat value chain, uh, starting with the farmer to the left. They raise an animal and they send it to slaughtering. At slaughtering, it gets killed and divided in two. So far, so good. And then it comes into cutting when they debone the animal. That's where the complexity begins. Because you can cut an animal in different ways. If you cut it one way, you get certain products. If you cut it a different way, you get some others. Meaning you're excluding some products when you make that decision. And you have to make that cutting decision based on uncertainty and demand but also an uncertainty in supply, which is quite uncommon. Since they don't know exactly how many animals that are coming, they don't know exactly the weight. And when they're also making this decision, they have to be able to deliver the demand today, but also in the future, as this is fresh food. And so that's the first complexity point. 
and you have hundreds of cutting patterns. The second complexity point is when it comes to processing. Since the industry can choose what type of meat to put into different types of processed products, and you still get the same result. So when you buy a hot dog, for example, in the, in the grocery store, on the back, it's, it's a recipe on it. And that's the same recipe every time. But to create that recipe, you have tons of possibilities. And the way they are solving this today is through Excel sheets and know-how in the organization. So what happens is that they get overproduction and non-optimal inventories and also unbalanced in supply. So with our first system that we have launched, we are optimizing the cutting and processing decisions. So they're making optimal cutting decisions and processing decisions. To give a little bit more practical example, uh, a similar hot dog to this has about 40,000 different ways to make it because there are so many types of animals, uh, so many types of cutting patterns and recipes you can choose between. So from our system, uh, we divide it up in, in three things uh, that our customer gets. Uh, one is production planning for cutting and processing, giving optimal solutions on how to cut every single animal and how to process it. And this we divide up in uh, production plans at what time and how many animals at, at each time uh, of a week. Then the second part is tactical inventory planning. Uh, since the industry has to be able to meet a demand in the future as well, so they have to build up a wanted inventory to meet future demand. So when should that start to be built and how should it be built? On the other hand, there are always some products that don't have a demand in the market and having the ability to know that early on so it can be pushed into the market before it becomes an issue. Uh, that's information that we provide to our system. Uh, and then lastly, uh, knowing the right supply to meet demand. So basically we can give the insights on exactly how many animals that are needed uh, to satisfy the expected demand. And then last, uh, what if simulations, where the industry can simulate different scenarios um, and compare that to the actual state of the value chain. So let's say that you can can uh, simulate an increase of a demand of a certain product and see the effects of your inventory and your value chain and compare it to the actual state. Uh, cutting animals uh, is not nothing new. Uh, this is something the industry has been doing for centuries. And But the way they are doing it is through Excel sheets and know-how. And uh, that's what's mostly common. Uh, and this uh, problem with trillions of combinations are way too complex, so they simplify it through Excel and know-how. Then there are um, solutions from um, ERP systems like uh, SAP, uh, but in those systems, they have to choose the cutting pattern, choose the recipes, and then they calculate the amount of needed animals. So it doesn't give them optimal solutions. Our solution is hosted in Azure uh, under Microsoft. We're also a partner in, in Microsoft, and uh, it's a standalone solution. So basically, our customer pushes data to us, and we provide them the insights through a web app where they can uh, download the information and take it further into their uh, value chain decision making. Our preliminary results uh, of 5% uh, improvement in demand satisfaction, uh, and in terms of an inventory, we are able to also reduce it uh, with approximately $20 million. Uh, so basically, with the same amount of animals, instead of building an inventory, we are able to use the inventory and uh, deliver a larger amount of, uh, of the market demand with our system. So in our, in our, uh, we have multiple revenue, revenue streams since one system is one animal and our customers usually have multiple animals kinds since each animal is their own value chain. So we can go, um, sideways towards different animals uh, even though it's only one customer and at the same time we uh, are developing more products today we have an uh, optimization of cutting and processing but we will uh, are working on including produ uh, production location a uh, production line logistics between the factories and the farmer location optimization so basically we have multiple products that we can continue uh, uh, launching to our customers so there are multiple revenue streams within one, one customer. Two minutes. Thank you. 
our management uh, team has a, a strong uh, industrial and technical background. I come from the meat industry, while the other co two co-founders, Adrian and David, uh, has a technical background. We're now a total team of nine. And then we also have a board of uh, directors with the former CEO of Ericsson uh, and uh, one of the co-founders of a company called eSmart Systems. And then also the former CEO of Notuda, which is the largest meat producer in Norway, is a part of our board of directors. Uh, our company is backed by uh, uh, strong investors. Um, uh, these are Norwegian uh, companies, so I don't uh, expect you guys to know them, but uh, in the startup scene, they are uh, quite well known. And then we're also backed by research institutes uh, that have invested in us within technology. And then also we are a Microsoft partner um, within their uh, startup uh, program and also backed by Innovation Norway. So that's uh, a little bit about Valor. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, uh, please reach out and let me know. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, um, Robert. Um, we will now ask the investors to start the five-minute Q&A session. Um, investors, if you have questions, go ahead. So if I can jump in, uh, Jenny or uh, Robert, uh, nice presentation. And you're solving, you know, a major, you know, supply chain logistics issue here right now. You know, you know, you know, you know, in a key, you know, part of a life, of our lives, right? So, so while you are looking at a comp, you know, simple day-to-day -day problem, you're looking at a very complex supply chain issue. So you did describe the problem, and it's a massive problem. What I would advise you: I have a question and a comment. You know, is while you describe the problem well, I was not able to, you know, clearly understand the revenue model. And like you rightly pointed out, there are multiple revenue streams. And maybe you can speak at a high level where, you know, and, and take on a smaller problem, you know, that you can prove that this is commercially viable. And it didn't speak about any financials, right? Where you are revenue wise, you know, and how it's going to grow, financial modeling over a three to five year projection. Say so maybe you can speak to that and then the competitive landscape. How are you going to grow and how are you going to make it happen? And how technology is helping you differentiate and achieve the, you know, the scales to growth. I was not able to, you know, clearly understand that. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, um, in terms of of revenues, uh, we are uh, we have a model today where we it's a SaaS model, a monthly uh, subscription for using the system, uh, and um, we are looking at improving our pricing model uh, to scale with the customer, uh, so that we are still working on. Today we have a set uh, subscription fee uh, for our customers, but we want to be able to set it up in a way where we can grow with the customer in a larger sense. Um, and uh, in terms of the competitive landscape, we uh, there are few companies that are focusing directly on the meat industry. There are many other companies that are uh, working on optimization within different types of uh, industries. But focusing directly on the meat industry, we haven't uh, found that many uh, competitors. Uh, that's why I, I dragged out Excel and know how the way they're actually doing it today is the main competitor. Um, so uh, I think we have found a, a sweet spot where there are not that much competition and there are some reasons for that. And I believe that's because of you have to have an understanding of the meat industry itself to be able to um, to create such a solution and also uh, the technical uh, background. And this is a conservative industry uh, which has not used that much innovation to, uh, in terms of data. Uh, so uh, I think we're quite early on. Uh, attacking the meat industry itself. So right now you're market looking at just the Norwegian market. Are you looking to you know scale it you know into other parts of Europe and at a global level? Right now you're just looking at the Norwegian landscape. Today uh, we have a customer in Norway, but uh, having a testing of the system with uh, 
uh, another company in, in Europe, outside of Norway, down in Austria. Uh, so we are looking to to get customers both in in Europe and also now we're starting looking at uh, at the states. But uh, for now, uh, we have a lot of opportunities in Europe. Yes. Good question. Um, do we have another question from the investors? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to come in. Uh, Tushar here, a nice presentation, Robert. Uh, Thank you. I just wanted to know uh, what's the revenue your uh, most uh, the you know the closest competitor of yours is doing right now. Uh, what they are doing right now that I don't have on top of my mind. As in, uh, how many competitors do you count uh, uh, in your field right now? I would say, uh, uh, to be honest, I think um, the closest solutions, uh, that is from companies like SAP uh, that don't have an optimization solution for uh, for the problem. Um, that's the closest one right now. And then you have other uh, uh, similar companies, but in other industries. Uh, so uh, the closest solution for a customer that they are comparing our system to is the way they have been doing it with Excel sheets and know-how, and then it's SAP. Uh, it. where that doesn't provide an optimization solution. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Time. Oh, all right. Well, we are out of time for Q and A. Thank you so much, Robert. And thank you also thank you. to the investors for great questions. Um, so uh, if you're interested again in learning more about Folur, uh, their contact information is on the website and they also have a table in the lounge. So please visit them. Um, great. Um, we now okay. want to call our next company, Phonic House, to the stage to pitch. Phonic House is building an exchange where investors can buy and sell shares of the listed artist's future recording revenue. Um, so, Jacob, uh, we are, um, please share your screen with your opening slide. Absolutely. All right. Can everybody uh, see this here? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. We have 10 minutes. Thank you. Great. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Jake Swindle. This is my partner, Josh Kravitz, here. Um, we're Phonic House. Thanks for joining us today as we revolutionize the entertainment industry. So Josh and I actually met in our time at IU together, um, we, where we started developing this company in 2020 after speaking with some of the students in the Jacobs School of Music there. Uh, now that we have the technical capabilities to really design a platform and the financial acumen to actually understand the industry, we decided it was about time to start the company up. We're allowing artists to crowdfund their careers through the creation of an exchange, allowing their supporters to grow financially with them. Let's talk about the problem today. There are two problems plaguing the music industry. First of which is a lack of control, and the second is a lack of compensation. Artists lack control over their own creations and the rights to their brands. They receive only 12% of the revenue attributable to their work. With our platform, artists know exactly which revenue streams they are giving up. Artists get to decide which third parties they'd like to involve in terms of management and agency. Instead of letting labels involve third parties as they see fit at whatever costs they choose. Artists will also increase their popularity inherently through listing on our platform through the expanded and energized fan base that's now materially incentivized to advocate for the artists. Now let's dive into the current state of the industry today. So as can be seen here, artists are forced into unfavorable revenue sharing agreements through what's become standard practice in the industry. Any money artists receive upfront through the label's advance program is recoupable against all of the label's costs down the line. Effectively, this signing bonus is actually just a loan with a brutal interest rate. The streaming market is growing drastically having increased eightfold over the past two years and expected to grow an additional fivefold to two billion music service subscribers by the end of the decade. 
This is really important because this because streaming only accounts for or accounts for eighty three percent of the recording industry's revenue. Here are some platform features. Investing in artists is the core of our business. Investors can do this by buying shares of a specific artist or investing in a pooled fund of multiple artists, such as an emerging rappers fund, rappers who have started within the last two years, or a Beyonce ETF, which tracks the artists that Beyonce is invested in or mentoring. It's also really cool that using all this AI and big data, we can tailor fit investment recommendations. Let's take a look at what it actually means to own shares. So ownership works much like that of stocks. The buyer owns a percentage of future streaming revenue of a given artist, which is paid to them quarterly in the form of cash dividends. And much like public markets, artists enlisting themselves are able to define a minimum price that they're willing to accept for the share of their future revenue they'd like to offer. And these shares are priced in a pre-listing auction. So if there's insufficient demand and thus insufficient capital raised through their listing, then the shares don't end up being listed and they're free to go with an alternative route. To prevent any foul play or non-payment, we will act as an intermediary between the artists, the investors, and the streaming services. So we collect all of the streaming revenue directly from those services and distribute it to shareholders based on their percent ownership. The artists are paid monthly since that's as they earn the revenue, but users are going to be paid quarterly so that we can most efficiently reinvest those dividends and idle cash balances into risk-free treasury assets. Now for my favorite feature. Similar to investment recommendations, we can use the same methodology to recommend new albums, merchandise, concert tickets, and even recommend new artists to stream. This will lead to a higher click-through and conversion rate than standard because we get to connect fans with the most relevant content. We will have a minimum following required for artists to ensure that we are catering to artists who can best utilize our platform and are sufficiently reputable to investors. Additionally, we will have how-to videos to help emerging artists emulate the benefits of a label covering topics like protecting IP and negotiating with third parties. All right, now let's see how the magic happens. In the top, we've got the artist being looked at, Sean James, with his share performance directly below. In the bottom, we've got stream growth to help investors evaluate his performance. In the bottom right, we have the latest merchandise where you can buy up-to-date designs. And immediately above that are his most popular songs, so you can give them a quick listen to before committing. Finally, in the top right is the feed page, where you can see the latest news about Sean James, like if he's following a new artist that you may want to check out, or when a new album is being released. All right, let's dive into our marketing strategy where we kind of have a two-pronged approach to spreading awareness here. Our first approach is going to be partnering with a major name or a top-tier artist to help promote the platform. We would likely need to compensate such a well-known artist today so we can gain the interest of the public. Such an artist will promote our platform to the public so they know that they're able to invest in up-and-coming artists, but arguably more importantly, they'll be able to spread the word to these up-and-coming artists themselves and it'll be great for them to hear these words coming from a mouth that they trust and they know have been in their shoes recently. We identified Chance the Rapper as a perfect fit for this due to his public disdain of the monopolistic practices of labels and our mission to break it ties very well into that disdain. Rihanna is another great example. She's a household name. She's going to hit a wide range of music lovers and that's going to give us that cross genre clout that we need in terms of available artists on our platform. Our second prong is a direct marketing strategy, identifying up and coming artists in un unaccounted for and underweight genres. Our goal is to have something for everyone to invest in. We identify musicians through sources like YouTube, TikTok, and Music Crown, where they are more likely to have trouble gaining traction and can benefit from our mentorship program to better scale. Three minutes. We get a couple of core features that will make it hard to compete against us. The first, and my favorite, is the much alluded to mentorship program. Artists will personally mentor multiple artists in the tier below them, 
allowing for artists of all levels to learn from those who were recently in their shoes. Additionally, this will energize and incentivize the fan base to explore and promote new artists that they see their favorite musicians support, creating a network effect. Mechanically, we will create this platform under current regulation crowdfunding laws, allowing for retail investors to participate, contrary to other programs that are limited to accredited investors only. In the future, we see this expanding way beyond music into all genres of entertainment, like athletes, actors and actresses, podcasts, and even more. All right, show me the money. How do you, the investors, and we make a return here? So we have three primary streams of income. Um, and as the main source, we charge 6% of all listed artists' streaming revenue. Additionally, a lot like Robinhood, we, we reinvest float on undispersed earnings and idle cash balances into short-term treasury securities. And then lastly, we collect click-through and conversion revenue from third-party links on our site which is great because that means our monetization strategy is actually all about providing users connect with, um, to connect with their favorite artists and to find content they may love. I know you guys are excited to invest now, so let's talk costs. Turns out people don't work for free. So we are budgeting $500,000 for legal work and $500,000 for building out the exchange. Diving into our assumptions here, um, our financials are based heavily on third-party data along with a handful of internal assumptions. Um, but the, the two key assumptions we had to make were artist counts and user counts. So by the end of the first quarter, we expect that 20 artists listed. One minute. And by the end of the first month, we expect total users to reach 1,000 conservatively. And these assumptions were used to build out our operational timeline. We currently include a $2 million placeholder to account for unknown marketing expenses in bringing on these bigger artists. And with respect to exit opportunities, given the opportunity that we have to expand into different facets, uh, holding ownership for an extended time seems feasible, but we definitely recognize the possibility of, of an IPO these days or even a buyout offer from a label or a streaming service or something along those lines in the field. Thank you so much for joining us today as we exchange the future of talent. Great. Well, thank you so much. That is the end of our time for the pitch session. Um, we will now ask the investors to start the five minute Q and A session. Um, investors, uh, do you have any questions for uh, your phonic house? I'll just say, I think that silence is because there was so much and I'm trying to figure out exactly what you're doing, even ranging from, is this product crowdfunding or equity crowdfunding when you take in investors? Yeah. That's a yeah, so, distinction, right? And yeah, so, yeah. So investors in our actual platform happen to have a traditional equity investment. They have a share in the revenues that we produce from the three streams that we have mentioned. Um, but when you're investing in an artist, that is much, much like a share of Microsoft, right? They pay dividends quarterly, and the same way our users will receive quarterly payments based on their investments in artist streaming revenue. So revenue-based. Correct. Or a dividend. Okay. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, I, I, I don't have a question as such, but... I do feel that you can simplify things more there. Uh, it would help you build the market better. And, uh, and you know, a good uh, startup is one which offers uh, value for a number of stakeholders. And uh, that would that transparency and simplicity would uh, guide you better. Yeah, I would uh, ratify what Tushar and, and Gwen said, you know. I think I see the the value proposition you offer and it's you know there is there is good room for disruption but you know start simplifying the the business opportunity and then take it to investors you know so then they'll understand and then they'll see the ROI and then in also onboard users I saw that you know because it's it's a matter of 
it's a it's a multi-tier business model right so you know you need to so there are artists it's you know it's it's the network effect so it's the same thing you know you have the artists and then you know then they have you there's been a heavy use of you know the modern media right social media the uh the digital the social platforms and how you leverage that ecosystem so that in turn will funnel your revenue generation and business growth so you may want to think on those lines yeah yeah absolutely yeah we think the mentorship program is going to be a great way to kind of help spread artist awareness given that based on your holdings you know we could say hey this artist you invested in received mentorship from these artists you may be interested in this or you know yeah the other way around you're invested in an artist that is invested in this portfolio of artists do you want to check out that um and it also kind of has an, an asymmetrical return aspect to it too just given the asset class is new totally totally asymmetrical with any kind of economic or like equity market performance generally today um, so we think, you know, those those things combine to allow for rapid expansion of users as well as rapid expansion in the fan bases and awareness of list artists. Absolutely. Oops. Thank you. Um, Gary, um, we'll give you the last word if you have one um, since um, you're our last investor. Um, well, I, I think it's a fantastic idea as everyone has, I'll echo what everyone said about that it, the industry is ripe uh, for, ripe for uh, disruption. I'm curious about the ETF strategy though. I mean, I like the idea, it's clever, but it seems like that's gonna run, a, if you're doing a crowd, if you're trying to fall under the regulatory framework of crowdfunding, does that have space for an ETF? Or would that have to be treated more like a, like a different flavor of security? According to Latham and Watkins, which is the law firm we took on, they, they believe that that is allowed, allowable within the law. They actually carried out, um, at least in terms of the legal structure and compliance that they had to deal with, they carried out a platform that's very similar um, in terms of what they need to consider. So uh, we thought they're a great team that's gonna help us navigate these waters in a cost-effective way. But uh, you know, yeah, to your point, this is new, this is new. And uh, that's, that's something that we think some of the legal costs will uh, have left to cover. We'll to it's, it's new, hence the asymmetric returns that you're promising. That's right. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, we are at the end of the Q&A session time. And so I want to thank um, Phonic House for the pitch. Um, again, if you are interested in learning more about them, their contact information is on the website. And they also have a, uh, a room that you can go visit. Um, I also want to thank our great investor panel. So thank you so much for your time and the great questions and comments and help that you have offered to the entrepreneurs. Um, we can all learn a lot from this exchange about what investors are looking for uh, from these venture companies when they pitch.